Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to another episode of uh, AUA, Ask Us Anything. Um, my special um, uh, co-conspirator here is uh, Josh, and uh, he and I are the yin and yang of uh, Bodhidharma. Good, good morning, Josh. How are hey, you? Hey, Danny. What's going on? It's a lovely day here in St. Louis, Missouri. How's it in California? It's, it's great here, too. It's cool. a, it's, it's, the weather's been amazing. Um, so um, you have a lot of notes that I wasn't able to incorporate all of which into the presentation. I incorporate um, uh, many of them. Uh, so, so there will be plenty of opportunities I would, that, that you can kind of interject as we go through the presentation. Um, so should we just get started? Sure, I'll just give a quick intro here. We're calling this one Chan Zen and Yi Jin Jing. And, um, you know, we've we've gone over, I'll include lots of links in the show notes. We've done Zen a little bit, so we haven't done too much Chan, but we're going to probably go into those a little bit as more of a background and focus more on Yi Jin Jing and kind of an enigmatic figure uh, surrounding Yi Jin Jing. Um, you know, I just thought today I mentioned real briefly, um, you know, since we're doing the show, I thought, you know, probably I ought to practice Yi Jin Jing. So I went to the park today and I'm not going to give an interpretation of this. And, you know, we talked about experience and we talked about experience and experimentation. Well, and don't let this color um, your perceptions of Yi Jin Jing. It's just a one off thing. So it's not going to be representative of anything other than maybe kind of the mystery surrounding some, some of the mystery surrounding Yi Jin Jing. So I set the intention, which is uh, with an experimentation of loving kindness when I was doing this, which is interesting, right? So when I look up and getting ready to do the big push, there is this dog, two dogs, the fluffy dogs sitting there right in front of me. And I, and I almost fall over when I do this. Uh, I managed to stand up, but so then I did it again and I focused more on my body, you know, so I wasn't paying attention to the external world. So then I was able to more um, stable. So, you know, and then the, the guy was like, he's having trouble controlling his dogs, you know, and they're whatever. Some people let them run. So it just almost done here. I Well, on the way home, though, I see this Cooper Hawk. It's a really big hawk and it comes in the local park every once in a while. And um it was perched next to a bird's nest and then there were some you know i don't know what it was doing in there um but then it flew off and there were other birds chasing it right they you know what they usually do sometimes they they'll peck the bigger predator bird as it goes and then there's a bunch of starlings which is a kind of a not native bird um, a lot of them making noise and then that was yeah so that's all i wanted to share take that for what it is or what it isn't you know i'm not going to interpret anything like that but yeah so um denny so Let's take it away here. Let's get okay. started. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Josh. Yep. You, you never know, Josh. You know, all those animals might be uh, incarnation of something. I mean, if you if you open the book, that you know, Buddha once upon a time were all of those. <laughs> anyway. Well, yeah, all the Jataka okay. tales. He had some. Yeah. So so we we time. actually um, usually it takes us a couple of weeks to decide you know what the topic ought to be. This one I actually decided um, almost immediately after we finished. Um, we talk a great deal about uh, qi, um, uh, and I thought it's 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 now time to really come back to the core of a practice, uh, which is which is uh, meditation, and and then also the prerequisites of that, which is yi jing jing. So ultimately, what I what I want to answer is the important question of why yi jing jing, as opposed to what is yi jing jing, because we we can do that in a, in a, in a, in a, in a later talk, but. The question is why Yi Jing Jing. So, so um, let me just kind of explain the title. Uh, I was going to put up a slide, but then I figured we, we kind of talk about this enough. So Chan 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 actually is the abbreviation for Chan Na. This, that's a that's a that's a Chinese uh, pronunciation of a uh, either a Sanskrit or Pali word called Jana. Jana. Um, some people interpret that as um, uh, as uh, uh, different stages of, uh, 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 of meditation, uh, some people interpret that as as, as uh, sentimentation. That is, you know, let your negative energy settle. Um, so, so that that's jhana, which became chana, and then later on, it's it's abbreviated into chan. 
And then when it went to Japan, when it went to uh, Korea, it was sun. And then when it went to Japan, it's zen. And there's another uh, pronunciation uh, in Vietnamese. But all those words come from Chan, which come from China, which come from Jana. Okay, so we got that out of the way. Now, Yi Jing Jing, this is, this is the word that uh, if you never heard of it, um, it's a, um, I'll call that a, a uh, I call that a yogi. I'll just call it a yogi practice because it came from a yoga, a yogi, okay? But yi, yi means exchanging. Jin, now, jin, the, the, the jin, jin is, uh, is somewhat controversial. It, most people would say that's tendon. Some people would, would go as far as saying this. Uh, how do you say that, Josh? Al new, et new? Which is the part that connects the, the, the tendon connecting to the bone? Is it um, uh, ten a i a i n e w? Oh, you know, I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah. So there's another part. There's another part that is that is that uh, of the anatomy. Uh, I I'm tending to think that Jin is uh, is either connective tissue or the spiral core. Uh, you would find that in in the Chinese literature that uses the same word. But again, the the point here is that don't ever interpret a single Chinese character. Because then it's you have in, you know infinite meaning depending who you want to talk to, and then the last one Jing it just means uh, treatise, uh, classic, uh, just a book or just a record. All right. So we're going to talk about Chan. We're going to talk about Zen, and then we're going to talk about Yi Jing Jing. Now um, this this is a very very busy uh, chart, but I think it's it's good. Um, so first of all, let's just let's just go down. Let's just go down uh, on the left-hand side, the legend. So the very dark um, kind of orange color is the essentially the origin of Buddhism. We all know that Buddha uh, uh, was a prince of a small kingdom, which is in what today's uh, Nepal. So even though we consider him a North Indian, he was actually born in Nepal. And so this is this this dark orange color is where the uh, Buddhism was was originated. Now what's interesting is that when you when you go to let's skip to the very light almost yellow color. This is this is actually when this is the area when uh, Buddhism first uh, first migrated. So you can see it goes as far as Kashmir, which is the border between uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan. And some of you might know that uh, when the Taliban uh, took over this this part of the world, they blew up some uh, some some uh, uh, Buddha statue, the world's biggest Buddha statue, which tells you that at, at one point uh, Buddhism was very active in this region. In fact, it's it's the first region that uh, Buddhism was was very active. Now, what's interesting is that the entire India is there. there there's no longer Buddhists. Uh, there are more there are more Catholics in India than there are Buddhists. Okay, that that religion actually kind of extinct. Now you might say, well, but but don't we go to India and see all these relics? Those are for tourists. Okay, those are entirely for tourists. Now what's more, what's, what's even interesting is that uh, originally Buddhism was quite active in Indonesia, very active in Indonesia, and was very active in uh, Philippines too. Okay. Now, of course, all that has gone because of, of, uh, of uh, Islam. So when Islam came to this part of the world, they, they took over. Uh, and, and so the only place where uh, Buddhism is active is, is great, basically in greater China, China, uh, uh, Mongolia, and Tibet. Uh, some people argue that Tibet is part of China, which is okay with me. And then it's also very active in the uh, Southeast China, uh, starting with uh, Sri Lanka, right here, to uh, Burma, or what is now called Myanmar, to Thailand. Now, what most people don't understand is that it's actually very, uh, uh, Buddhism in Thailand is actually very recent. It's less than a thousand years old compared to other parts. For, for some reason, uh, Buddhism went to Myanmar, went to Cambodia and, and Laos, but kind of skipped Thailand. And it's only after the Mongolians invaded China then a lot of the monks kind of came down north from uh, from and then and then and then also they came up from the from the Sri Lanka, and so now. So the other thing that is interesting is is um, is the timeline the timeline, 
So we talk about the early uh, Buddhism, and then we talk about Mahayana, and then the Theravada. Uh, so, so we did that a little bit. So I would just kind of summarize, okay? So just kind of put things in perspective, temporally. Uh, 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 Sikata Gautama is the name of the historical Buddha. This is the name uh, before he was, uh, he was enlightened. And so he was born essentially 550 years, 563 years uh, before Christ, before uh, a common era. So he lived for 80 years, so that we know. So this is kind of, uh, so, so um, uh, Buddhism is 2,600 years old. That's, that's what you need to remember. Now, last time we, last few times, we talk about um, the councils. So the first council was after Buddha passed away. The second council was a couple hundred years later when they had some issues with the, the rules and regulations. And then the third council, which is the most important one, is with King Asuka, uh, who, who kind of consolidated all of the teachings into these three buckets. Okay, the sutra, the... The, the, the rules and regulations and then and then and then all that and so the what we know about uh, Buddhism as it migrates out of the heartland really starts with uh, King Asuka so the first one is what we call the Theravada and this is starting around that time third century so Theravada is the green line it went down to first the Sri Lanka and then from Sri Lanka it went to uh, Mer uh, 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 Burma and then eventually it went to Thailand and then from there it went to uh, Cambodia and Laos. So that's the ex uh, extent of the Theravada teaching. And um, if, if you want to know more, just um, we, we had a talk on that. And then, then the red arrow is what is called the Mahayana. The Mahayana uh, as, um, started in the 4th to 5th century. And so last time we talked about um, it's inaccurate to call everything else Hanayana. Because the Theravada, it's just look at the timeline. The Theravada basically predates the Mahayana by seven centuries. Okay. Now, what's interesting is that what we call Mahayana, which is really Chinese, that's actually the more accurate description is, is that it is Chinese Buddhism. Because the Chinese Buddhism is very unique in that it's not a pure, it's not pure Buddhism. It's actually a combination of Buddhism, Taoist, and Taoism, and, and Confucianism. Okay, so, so people might say that they are Mahayana. What they're really saying is that they're Chinese. They're Chinese Buddhism, which has a very unique uh, characteristics. Um, I, I, not all of the teachings are, 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 are from Buddha. I, I, I dare to say that. Now, what's interesting is that um, when, when the Buddhism first went to China, it wasn't Mahayana. Okay, so... So let me explain that. So the very first milestone, the very first time that it's been documented that uh, Buddhism went to China was this, this, this temple called the White Horse Temple in Luyang, in uh, Honai. And the reason we, we know that is because it's, it's historically documented that there was, a, there was an emperor and the emperor had a dream, had a vision and there was a bright light on the west, so he went to his uh, his uh, his staff and said, "What's going on?" And they said, "Well, there was a great sage that was born, um, and uh, so he sent his uh, his, uh, his 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 um, his ministers to go look for that." And uh, so the ministers uh, got halfway, and they met up with two monks that came from essentially Kazakhstan. And so they, they came with a bunch of books and they were monks and so they were very happy. And so they built this, this, uh, this temple for them so that they can uh, start the teaching. And the first book that they, uh, the first uh, sutra they uh, 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 interpret was this thing called the Sutra of 42 Chapters, which actually is a lot closer to the Theravada teaching than it is to the Mahayana teaching. In fact, it, there is no resemblance to the Mahayana teaching. It's all Theravada teaching. So, I guess the point. My point is that when we talk about Mahayana, when we talk about Chinese Buddhism, that's a very recent uh, event. The original wasn't like that. The original were 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 much closer to the to the uh, Theravada teaching. Now we all know about a a monk, a Tong Dynasty monk that went to India through the mountains and so forth. Um, 
and uh, there was a uh, uh, the journey of the west if you know if you if you, if you that that is very famous with the monkey and the pig and all that well that that's obviously a uh, fiction but he wasn't even the first monk there was another monk prior to that who who went from uh, China to India and he was in search of remember we talked about the three buckets the first bucket was the sutra the second bucket that is called the uh, uh, vinanya which is the rules and regulations the the, the the precepts so he was looking for that because he felt that that the, the monks weren't practicing correctly so he wanted to find the original document to to really so he can bring back the discipline so he went there for that what's interesting is that he went through the land, but he came back through the sea. And so he actually went through uh, what, what we call Salang, which is Sri Lanka. And there he actually found the original teaching of Buddha, the, what we now call Agama teaching. And Agama, whenever you see an A, that means that's a negation, not. Gama means that they're leaving. So Agama means that when, when Buddha was, was, uh, was uh, enlightened under the Bodhi tree, he went searching for his, uh, his, uh, his, 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 uh, his, his, uh, essentially his bodyguards. So, when he when he left the uh, palace, the, his his father sent uh, five bodyguards, five or six, I don't remember. And uh, so they they also become uh, monastics, and so they were practicing together. So so when and then when when uh, when when the historical Buddha gave up the teaching to search for his own path, his bodyguards or his, uh, his, uh, his followers um, basically abandoned him. So, so he went back and he basically said, don't go away. And so Agama means don't go away, come back. And so he, uh, this, this, this monk actually uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the fifth century actually went to India and on the way back uh, into Sri Lanka brought back what is called the Agama Sutra. Okay, into into uh, into into China. So finally, you get to the the the, the more famous monk, the one that went to uh, India on his own, and uh, and that's now in the seventh century. What's interesting is that most people don't really know what he did, other than that he was a good interpreter. That he brought back all these scripts, and then he he had a, a big effort to translate it. What people don't know was that he also founded a a particular sect particular sect. Now, I, I couldn't find the, the Chinese, uh, the English interpretation of the sect. It's called Fa Xiang. Fa means Dharma. Xiang means, um, it's hard to explain that, but it's like the characteristic of Dharma. And so this, this Dharma has different interpretation. This particular Dharma has to do with, you know, when we talk about the, the sound, the sight, the smell, the touch, and then we say Dharma. Because the, the you know that's the physics, and then the all the, the the physiology that associated with that are the eyes and the ears and the nose and the tongue and the body and the mind. Okay, so in this case, the mind is actually the brain, and in this case, dharma means all the uh, perturbations inside your mind, and so 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 in this case, mind means in this case, dharma means consciousness. Okay, this, this, the, the eight consciousness, right? So there's there's a big emphasis on the six sense bases, the six sense doors, the six yes, sense spheres, yes, yes. and all that goes around that surrounds yeah. that. Yeah. Yes. Now, what's interesting is that another name for that means that this word and this word means only uh, consciousness, right? But it actually came the, the it in in uh, uh, another it's actually came from the word called yokachara. Yogacara is the practice of yoga. Now, they're not talking about the practice of the asana or the hatha yoga. That's not what they're talking about. They're not talking about practice of yoga as you do in the gym. That's, that's a, a fast food version of yoga. Okay? So what they're talking about yoga is the, is the, is the historical, is the authentic uh, study of the mind. That's what yoga means. Okay. Now this this sometimes gets interpreted as mind only, right, or consciousness only. Is consciousness right? only. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Yeah. Consciousness only. Now, of course, he he started that, but it, it it never took off. It never took off. Okay. So finally, we have Bodhidharma. That's what we want to talk about. He is the first patriarch of Chan, Chana, 
or, or Zen. Now, people, people argue when, when he actually appeared, but there was a historical fact that he had a meeting, it was documented, with the Emperor Wu of the Lerang Dynasty, which is a very short-lived dynasty, and he lives in the 6th century, so we know that. So he, he more or less came in that, that part. And then finally, I want to talk about, so this is the first patriarch, then I want to talk about the sixth patriarch, because the sixth patriarch is really when the, 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 the Chan meditation, the Chan school really, uh, and, 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 and Josh had a very nice set of notes on the five schools. And so the, the, the kind of folklore is that that was predicted by Bodhidharma. He actually said that, you know, so, so there was a lot of folklore. For example, Bodhidharma had a bowl and a, and a gasa, and, and it was supposed to transmit from one generation to another generation. And he said that by the time we get to the sixth, you don't need to do that anymore. Because by the time you get to the sixth, it would be one stamp, five flowers, something like that. So he kind of predicted that, but who knows, right? I wasn't there. Yeah. So I want to just kind of focus on that. So this is, this is when, when Chan first became popular. He was the founder in the 6th century, but it really became uh, 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 very popular, starting to be very popular in the 7th and 8th century. It started from the 1st to the 6th. To the very quickly, I was just talking about this. The, the, the sixth patriarch is, is a, because I want to talk about Zen, because Zen came later. Danny, okay. before we get into that, let me go back to the last slide. I just wanted to uh, make a quick comment here that probably can't uh, yeah, be please, answered. Please, but please, with the very it. first thing, the White Horse Temple, you know, um, that story, it's, a, it's, a, it's just uh, a very kind of mystical story almost, you know. And I was always wondering who the sage was that they were going to go see but they never made it and how did the monks coming from the sage you know did they have foreknowledge and of, uh, of course you know um what exactly uh, so you know why did they bring those teachings instead of other teachings you know so and it's just really interesting the dream imagery and whatnot so yeah there's things we won't really know um, well uh, the, the, the the answer to that one part uh, uh one part answer is that um they they couldn't have brought the Mahayana teaching because Mahayana teaching was not invented yet. It wasn't invent and it wasn't invented until the second second century. So that's all they have. Okay. So now I this this is gonna piss people off because I actually take the position that Mahayana was invented. Well, I actually hear that too. You know, I don't really, yeah. I mean, I just, I, it would take a lot more study for me to comment either way on that as well. It's interesting where they, where they got the, the Sutra of 42 chapters at as hey, well. But, it, but it doesn't mean that, that it's not, it doesn't mean anything because the Bible was invented. Well, that, that's the thing. So that is not as important as the, the, the usefulness of the teachings, right? And how yeah. they can be applied to everyday life and wisdom. That's more important. You know, the other stuff is just kind of scholarly stuff, which is fascinating too, but we don't want to lose sight of no, the actual I mean, I think the, this life. is okay. I mean, you, you always have, you always have people who are, who are enlightened. And then, and then I, I think the idea that, that everything has originated from a single point of reference, that is wrong. Because, because now, now you're trying to turn the teaching into an intellectual exercise as opposed to what we have always been saying, an experiential exercise. Exactly. Right? And it gets, if you it actually, gets... look, you know, who cares where Mahayana teaching come from if right. you actually can experience enlightenment through it? And it filters through everybody's own experience as well. And then it just, you know, changes a little bit like that, perhaps, as well. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I totally agree. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So can we go on? Okay. Yes, please. So, so very quickly, very quickly, it's a very famous story, very famous story that the sixth patriot, number one, is that he was illiterate. He was illiterate. Look, Muhammad was, was not, uh, not a scholar. So, you know, if you're enlightened, you're enlightened, okay? So, now, what this, I, I don't want to go through that very quickly, but this, this is the part of the story where um, he wasn't even the, the designate. Uh, six patriot. There was there was somebody else who everybody thought that he was going to be the sixth patriot, and so one day the fifth patriot wanted to have a contest, and he asked all his uh, students to wrote a poem, a poem, 
And of course, all the other students wouldn't dare to write anything, knowing that the senior student was going to be the, the, the designate um, um, uh, sex patriot. And so only he would write the poem. And so the first poem uh, was written by him. I actually like this poem much better than the one that was written by the sex patriot. The sex patriot wrote the second one. I love this poem because it really talks about how you're supposed to practice, okay? So you, 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 it's hard to explain. You have, the, the English translation doesn't do it justice. So let me going to try. So, so first of all, it says that the body is like the booty tree. So, so what you have to understand is, is the significance of the word body in the, in the Chinese culture. So when we, in the Chinese culture, we always start with the body. So there's a, there's a whole Confucius teaching that if you want to be the ruler of the world, you start with the body. You have to live a righteous life first. Then you have to take care of your family. Then you have to take care of your community before you even attempt to take care of the society and, and the universe. So, so the idea is that you start with the word body. It, it kind of brings that, that, that in your practice, you start with yourself. And yourself is like the tree that you want to grow. So this brings back to like the standing posture that we stand like the pine tree. Okay. That the, the idea is that is that is that you have to be firmly on the ground and you have to be flexible. This is actually all the good characteristic of, of a sage. Okay. So this poem, the English doesn't do it justice because it says that. It basically talks about someone who, who's who's uh, who's uh, who's uh, who's an advanced student, someone who's uh, who's uh, who's uh, who's uh, who's, uh, who's, a, who's a monk, and how he should be practiced. That he 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 he, he, he focus on his body, he focus on himself, and then he envisioned this as the Bodhi tree. Bodhi just means awakened, wisdom, right? Now, then he says, your mind is like the mirror. And again, it doesn't do it justice because it's not just the mirror, but the bright mirror. What do you mean by bright mirror as opposed to a bright light? A bright light shines. A bright mirror reflects. So this is really the practice is that, is that when we talk about Vipassana, when we talk about contemplation, it's, it's, it's really like looking deep into your mind as a reflection. Okay, so here he's talking about, he's not just talking about the, the mirror, but a mirror that reflects bright, brightly. Then he says the platform. So he says the mind is like a platform where the mirror sits. And this is important. Now, you have to understand that, that before Bodhidharma, the most popular uh, Buddhism is something called Tentai. Okay which if I explain, I, I think the next slide is, is really the, the study of the Lotus Sutra, okay? So Thai, Ten Thai is, a, is, a, is actually the name of, of one of the patriarchs for that particular sect. And so he's borrowing that word to say that, that Thai means platform, okay? So now he's talking about this, the, the, the mind is like the mirror that shines that is on top of this platform. So he's, he's stepping on the shoulder of some great stage. Then he says, then you must constantly, so this is, this is uh, constantly, very diligently. And then he's talking about the dusting where you, you know, where you have the stick and then a, a, a horse hair. Like all the, the Taoist priests, or so they carry this. You know, you see this in movie. So he says, therefore, you must constantly wipe clean the mirror because you don't want it to collect dust. Now, the word that he used is not collect, even though you translate it as collect. The word that he used is, is, is contaminate. Is contaminate. Or when you, when, you dye, when you dye clothing, you start with a white piece of cloth and then it becomes color. That process is, is this one here. Okay? It's a beautiful poem. It really describes, it really describes what a person should be doing in, in, in his practice. Now, of course, the sixth preacher had came and he's, he's, he is so advanced. He is so advanced that he is so above us that he says, the Buddha is not a tree, right? The mirror is not a platform. We ain't got a thing. So how we collect dust? <laughs> this is coming from emptiness. You know, this is like, this is, 
you just saw that and you say, wow, man, this is cool. But it, it, it doesn't, it, to me, it doesn't really help me. See, that's yeah. the thing. It's like the, the first poem, it, yeah, is more like the, um, the standard practice. And then the, the second one kind of goes beyond that, right? So you kind of got to fully uh, realize and embody the first uh, understanding of the first thing and be able to speak about that and then go on to the other. Let me just read, there's several different English translations of this. Let me just read real briefly another uh, one here on, on uh, this translation. So the first part is, the body is the Bodhi tree, the heart mind is like a mirror. Moment by moment, wipe and polish it, not allowing dust to collect. And then of course the second part from the, the future six patriarch here, Bodhi originally has no tree. The mirror has no stand. Buddha nature is always clean and pure. Where might dust collect? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's not, yeah. I've heard of some, some other ones that are uh, better than that. Um, yeah. You know, the one yeah. that, uh, um, um, yeah. Ajahn, um, oh, um, I'm forgetting his name in, Cal uh, in, in Canada now. Uh, I like his version, but I'd, maybe I'll include that in the show notes. Okay. Okay. Thanks, John. But the reason the, the reason I I wanted to do this is, even though we talk about Bodhidharma as the first patriarch of Chan that eventually became Zen, Bodhidharma left no teaching. Okay, so so the teaching really came from the six patriarchs. So we all know about the platform sutra, which was essentially a collection of saying because he, he's he's illiterate. Um, so when we talk about Zen Buddhism. It really start with this poem, okay? It starts with this poem that that we ain't got a thing. We have not a thing. That's the emptiness part, okay? So this is important. Okay, so should I go on? Okay, all right. Okay, so now we're going to talk about history of the Japanese Buddhism because we want to talk about how Chan became Zen, okay? So Buddhism was was first. Buddhism first went to Korea. And then from Korea it went to Japan, and so it was it was basically in the in the fifth or sixth century, okay. So this is this is um, this is predate the Tang Dynasty. This is actually quite early, and of course, so obviously the first the 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 the, the Buddhism that was brought to Japan initially was not Zen, okay. So this is people don't understand that and they think that everything starts with Zen. That's not true. It actually the the if you go to Japan, one of the one of the very popular um, uh, Zach is this thing called Shingang. Shingang means uh, uh, Shingang came from the kanji here means real speech or real. Um, uh, uh. So this is actually mantra. Okay, now, so you know in Japan, Japan is made of four islands. You have the Hokkaido, you have the uh, uh, you have the main island, and then to, and then you have the Gaoshu. Uh, if you know ramen, then you know gaoshi ramen. <laughs> but there's a, there's a part, the tiny one, uh, that most people don't know. There, there are 88 uh, temples in there. And, and people, once in a lifetime, this is sort of what they want. Once in a lifetime, they will want to walk all 88 temples. I, I, actually, I actually have a book where you know, people would stamp as you go. I got four stamps so far, so I got 84 to go, okay? This is a lifetime thing. And all those are uh, shingong. Shingang. Now, what is Shingang? What is mantra? So, the the map that we showed earlier has the three main sect has the um, has the um, uh, the Theravada, the Mahayana, and then sort of the esoteric part that people associate that with Tibet. Tibet. Now, <clears throat> so most people just think that that's that's all there is, but actually. The, this esoteric part actually was very, very popular in in uh, in China during the Tang Dynasty, but it died out just out of one event. There was one emperor that didn't like Buddhism. He was he wanted to promote Taoist Taoism, and so he he just basically cut off all the support to Buddhism, and and it's at that moment that this esoteric sect died off in 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 China. But the legend was that right before that. This monk actually went and visit, and the 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 monk who transmit the Dharma to him said that where have you been? I've been waiting for you for three years now, and transmit all the teaching to him. He brought it back to Japan. So today, this this Shingang or Mantra school is only exists in Japan. 
and uh, and Thai and Taiwan because Japan the Japan had occupied Taiwan for a while, and then that's one part, and then and then the other the other version of that is in the in in Tibet. Okay, so this is very popular. Then another one that is very popular is the one I mentioned, the Tentai. The Tentai is is basically they focus on the the Lotus Sutra. Okay, so this these all these predate predated Zen. The very first monk that that he was actually a Tentai monk, and then he dis, he went to China, and he brought back a a, a, a sect. So so I mentioned that there are five schools, five sects, and so only really two. So so to be honest, um, uh, Chan Buddhism doesn't exist in China anymore. Not as a pure form. It's it's kind of mixed in with something else. The only pure form of Chan Buddhism exists only in Korea and in, in, in Japan. And in Japan, there are two sects. There is this one called the Renzen, and then the one called Soto. Now, the Renzen is actually very popular in uh, Korea. And so this actually originally was brought to Korea, uh, brought from Korea, and then this monk actually went back to China and, and reabsorb it and brought it back to. Now, the, the difference between Renzen and then I'll talk about the other one, Soto, is the Renzen uh, uh, has the, uh, I always say it wrong, Koron, Koron, Kong? Well, Renz, I've heard it pronounced Renzai as well. Renzai, um, Renzai. No, you're right. Renzai, it, yeah. And then it, it's Koan. Like, uh, I think it's a, a, la yeah. a, a last name of a Jewish person, too. I mean, there's, uh, there's a Jewish uh, family line called uh, Cohen. The, oh, it's okay. similar. It's actually the same. But koan, actually, yeah, koan. Okay, is, it's 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 a it's koan. a saying that the 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 master customized for the disciple. Things What's the like, sound of one hand clapping? Yeah, right? yeah. The, the one is very popular. Koan. The one I like is the one in Korea. I mentioned that last time. It's called Yimu Go, which is Who Am I? Yeah, like that. Okay, so then then later on, uh, another uh, monk, uh, Jun, which is the most famous one, he went back. Uh, 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 to China, he brought back Soto. Soto, and I hear now, it pronounced Dogen. By the way, Do Dogen Zenji. Um, Dogen Zenji. Yeah, actually, the Chinese is Daoyan, but Dogen Dogen Zenji. Zenji means um, uh, the teacher teacher of Zen. Yeah. Okay. Now, what's interesting? A little bit of background. So before Renzai was imported into Japan. The country was ruled by the the nobility, ruled by the the, the the emperor, as as most countries are. When when Zen Buddhism was brought into Japan, the idea that that this I'll talk about this later on, where where it's a no thinking concept, that that you do the perception, but not the not the what's the what's the word that I'm looking for. You know, you, I'll give you an example. So when, when, when you see these samurai movies and the two samurais were facing each other and they could be like, they're not even staring at each other. They, they just listen to each other for hours. They could be like in the rain, you know, it's a very famous scene. And then all of a sudden one guy moved and another guy moved and he moved so much faster that he would cut off his, his waist or cut his head without even a drop of blood on his blade. And, and what they're doing is they're focusing on the perception without contaminated with their own um, hindrances, own emotion. That came from Zen Buddhism. And it, and was, only the, uh, it was only that then the samurai class got elevated. And so the country was essentially, from that point on, was ruled by the shoguns. And it wasn't until the, towards the end of the 19th century when uh, uh, Emerald Perry um, went to Japan with a bunch of battleships that they went to the Minji Restoration. That's when they when they decided to elevate the, the emperor once again and 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 essentially uh, abandon or de, uh, eliminate the, the shogun system. Okay, it's very interesting. Now, so there's a there's a there's a very famous saying that the Renzai is for the shogun and the Zoto is for the peasant. Okay, the Zoto is a much more simplified version. They don't have this corn thing that they have because the idea is that all you have to do is sit. So there's a very famous uh, saying called Shinkatasa. And if you interpret it, it's just only sitting or sitting only. Just sit. Just sit and awakening will come, which is too simplified. 
which is way too simplified. And this is one of the problem I have with my experience with the Zen uh, practitioners in the United States is that they take that too literally. They just sit and they ignore many, many things, including the body. Because Shinkatasa actually came from something else which is interpreted as silent illumination. And I think I talk about this. I don't want to go through that here. Yeah. Okay, a few comments. You know, that's that's one great pro about the different schools of Buddhism is that some of them are a better fit for certain uh, folks than others. You know what I mean? So um, no, I, some I people can benefit I, yeah. a lot more from a certain school th than others. Or some people actually need to be in a school where they're not comfortable so yeah. they get that uh, that as well. So yeah, the the, the other thing about the samurai, yeah, we talked about this before. It's more like they're just going on sense impressions and instinct and decisiveness and, and just making decisions. No thoughts, no language, no time for any. It's just whatever they're perceiving through sense data and action. There is, yes. you know, it's just yeah. uh, from the training, yeah. right? Yeah. And then yeah. the other thing I wanted to say is uh, we don't have time to go into this, but. The, the Korean Buddhism, um, I don't, like we did, like you, you did, did too, it just was briefly mentioned, although you mentioned somewhat throughout, this is something I don't hear much about at all. So maybe that's uh, another point of um, study for me in the yeah, future. Yeah, we, could, we could do that. There, there, yeah, we could do that. So, so there are a couple of good points that Josh mentioned. I wanted to kind of repeat them. One, one, is, one is that um, there, there's, no, there's no right or wrong. There's only right for you or not right for you. And that's the key, right? So, Kusala, uh, skillfulness, right? Yes, yes, yes. So, so you notice that I, I bring a lot of historical context. And the reason is that I want you to, the audience, to be better consumers, to be better informed consumers. That when you look at a practice, you know, it's not about right or wrong. There is no such thing as right or wrong. But some of the, some of the practices are better for you more suited for you because of your karma seat. Because you actually have probably done this before in a previous life, okay? And that's why they are more familiar to you. That's the truth. And so that so then you do that. Whereas, you know, when you do something else, you realize that you don't it doesn't make sense to you. Well there's a they just don't don't do it then. That's one. The other one is is I'll I'll talk about this more. It's really about using your brain versus using a spiral cord. Okay, now just, just, I'll let that hang for a little, little while. Okay, I'll come back to that. All right. And I just okay. wanted to wrap up there by saying, you know, that it's, it's just tough. For, well, first off, I want to say thanks for the history because for me, um, I'm not as good in the history because um, I won't go into that. I, why it's not so good because I hear, you know, I, the generally accepted history is sometimes very accurate, but then a lot of times it gets really politically colored and there's a political motivation for a lot of the history. And then when some other things come along that that's been trying to suppress, I find that's really interesting. But it's trying to get to the truth of history, but it goes through so many filters as well. But anyway, that's needed for Yeah, uh, well, context, history is, history things. is, yeah, exactly, Josh. History oh. is his story. So first of all, it's a story. Then there's a gender bias. <laughs> or there anyway. can be right yeah, yeah anyway okay. yeah. The, the other the real quick thing now right or wrong you know ultimately yes there is no right or wrong there's only you know there it, it doesn't apply ultimately then again if you're working on ethics there are things that are you know um traditionally right or wrong however buddhism instead of looking at good and evil there's more emphasis placed on is this skillful useful wholesome and wise yes. so that way yes. you don't get people yeah. arguing about good correct, and bad correct, what's correct, good correct. and bad so, so, so yeah I, yes. thank you for thank you for the josh so, so let me let me correct myself by saying that when i say right or wrong i, I said it with the context of all roads lead to rome okay so which means that you have to kind of we, we kind of all have to agree on a destination and then we have to have to agree on a set of metrics that tells you that you're heading in the right directions but once we agree on that, then there's a lot to choose from because all roads lead to Rome. I, I think that's that's probably what Josh had in mind. Yeah, yeah kind of like laying the groundwork and the yeah. and knowing the de destination, right? So great yes, point. Yes. Okay. So this is uh, this is a, a chart that I I, I I put together some time ago, and this just summarizes what I talk about in terms of how uh, Chan became Zen. Okay. 
So I'll skip this part in a minute. I'll talk about this. And then, then so, so uh, Buddha's teaching went through down to Bodhidharma. Bodhidharma teaching went from the first, second, third, and fourth. And then eventually went to the sixth patriarch. The sixth patriarch was the one that split it into, or his students were the one that split it into five different sects. One of the sects was, was uh, picked up by um, uh, Dojin and then eventually brought it uh, to Japan and then later on was brought to the United States. Uh, actually, um, it was brought to the United States uh, before, before uh, uh, Suzuki Roshi. Because he, he came as a Soto Zen. He actually started uh, in, a, in a temple in, in the uh, uh, Japanese town in San Francisco. Then he strike out on his own and then he started the San Francisco Zen Center. I did that because at that time I was talking to my friends from the San Francisco Zen Center. Okay, so this is this is a this is a chart that shows shows that. All right, now the question is, so we talk about Bodhidharma, we talk about how he was the first patriot, and then eventually his teaching was passed on to the sixth patriot. Then it became these five families. So what was, what was Bodhidharma's teaching? And Denny, this. This is a central question that I once you get to it, I want to come back with my kind of uh, side notes uh, answering this question because I have a lot of potential answers to this question. Let's just yeah. put it that way, and I'll, I'll talk yeah. to that. After so, you get. so now you have to understand that 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 Buridama, um came from India. He came by sea. He actually uh, landed in Canton Province. You could, there's actually a place you can go to. That, that says that he had landed there. He, he made his way up into the north. He met up with the emperor. And the emperor asked him a question and he gave the wrong answer. And so he wasn't, wasn't being supported, being supportive of him. So he, he kind of went away in disgrace, or more or less. And then he then went to what is now called the Shaolin Temple, which wasn't much at all at the time. And then he found himself a cave and then he screwed himself for nine years, and then he emerged. And when he emerged, he didn't really have any kind of teaching, except this thing called the Yijing Jing, which is just a bunch of exercise. What's you know what's going on? What's going on? Why did he do that? Why was why did he find that to be important? So, so this 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 story. I want to mention this story because if you watch the movie, there's a very good movie that talks about the life of Bodhidharma in Chinese. They talk about this story, and this story kind of everybody associates with with the Bodhidharma now. Where in fact it it really wasn't him who told the story. It was actually one of the disciple of the sixth patriarch who told the story, and the story was this. So so this was. This was uh, Wai Yang. Wai Yang is, is the, is the, is, is the, is the uh, Zen teacher. He had a disciple uh, younger than him, you know, quite a bit younger than him. He himself was, was, the, was the disciple of the Sixth Patriarch. And his young, young student was, was very diligent. He likes to sit all the time, you know, he likes to do meditation all the time. So one day the master said to the student, says, uh, do you know why you're doing this? And he says, well, I want to be enlightened. I want to be a Buddha. So the teacher went away and he brought back a, a brick and he started polishing the brick. And, and then the student got curious. He went to the master and says, master, master, what are you doing? He says, I'm polishing a mirror. And the student laughed. He says, how can you polish a mirror out of a brick? And he says, well, if you could just sit there and become Buddha, why couldn't I polish a mirror out of a brick? So this is a good story. It is associated with Bodhidharma, even though it's, it, historically it's not accurate. So what was the message there? What is the message there? Why can't someone become enlightened just by sitting? Because I see all my friends in the Zen center. That's all they do. I see all my friends in all the other temples. That's what they do. Every time you know of someone who, who learns meditation, that's what they do. right? You go to take the 10-day Vipassana class. They do that for 10 days. Just sit, thinking that someday they would become a Buddha. And so this story says that, well, if you could do that, then I can definitely make a mirror out of a brick, polishing a brick. So what's the problem? So before I talk about this, I want to talk about what do we do, uh, try to achieve in a practice? This is the spiritual part. This is the spiritual part of a practice, right? 
So I remember last last week, uh, Josh. I don't know if you were there. I think Kendall, the the the, the person who is very very bright, and he asked the question: What's the difference between Daoyan and Qigong? And I gave a answer and said, Well, you know, the Qigong, the word means something, and it was something that the communists put together in 1962. It was meant to be just a physical practice. So essentially, they take Daoyan, which is very spiritual. And I didn't say the word then, but I said the word in one of my writing, and I said it castrated it into qigong, so that is no longer spiritual. So I thought about that that some more, and I said, well, I remember one time um, in the beginning of the Chinese New Year, um, a friend came to me and says, well, I want to translate this Chinese verse into into English, and it talks about the oxen. And I said, yeah, just just say golden oxen, that's all. He says, yeah, but an oxen is a castrated bull. So an oxen is a castrated bull, like qigong is a castrated daoyan. So it depends who you ask. If you ask the oxen, what is the difference between oxen and bull? I bet the answer is pretty much the same. If you ask the bull, the bull is going to say there's one missing part. <laughs> I like this analogy, didn't it? Yeah. So you can't talk about practice without really talking about the spiritual part. So what is the spiritual part? So the spiritual part that that says that our existence is in three realms. So there is this realm called the karma realm, the sense desire realm. This is where we are. So we are humans, and then there's divas above us, and then below us. There is the uh, Azura, which is like the demigods. There is the Hell. There is the Hungry Ghost. There is the um, 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 Hell, Hungry Ghost, and 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 also the um, uh, Animal. So all the animals has its own place. So humans is an, is one of the animal, but we consider ourselves, you know, the 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 uh, separate from that. And so this is where we are. So when you die, you can come back as a human, or you can come back as a cockroach. Okay, that's 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 what I mean. Now you say, well, I don't want it. This is too much for me. Then just go back to the oxen. Okay, this we're talking about the bull here. Okay. All right. So now what the what people do, whether you are a Taoist or a yogi or a Buddhist, your goal is to escape this sense, this this uh, this desire realm. So the next realm is called the the rupa realm, the form realm, and the one after that is called the formless realm. If you're stuck in these three realms, you still have to go through what is called samsara. Okay, you're not a, you're not awakened yet, you're not enlightened yet. So Buddha, you know, to be a Buddha, you actually have to escape all three. Okay, now this is this is good background. So, what is our first goal? Our first goal is to escape the desire realm, so that we can go to the form realm. Okay, so the first, so the the form, the form and the uh, and the uh, uh, and the formless combined. There's seven stages, uh, eight stages. So the first state, the first four of these stages are called jhana samadhi. Okay, so the eight of them, the first four. Is in the in the form realm. So in order to reach that form realm, you have to escape what is called the five hindrances. The five hindrances. So attachment, aversion, sloth, resistances, and doubt. Okay. Now the first one you can escape from is the doubt. So I think of this as a path. And you, and because I grew up in China, and when I visit my grandfather, the the my uncles would drive, would, 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 I would give me a ride on this on, the, on this uh, bicycle, and they would be running, they would be riding bicycle in the dark, total darkness on this one very skinny road, which have like the field on the on both sides. So I I always think about this this road. I always think about this road, and if you can reach to the end, then you have reached. The first stage of the form realm, but there are there are there are possibility of falling off. So either you fall off this side or you fall off that side. So I, I don't want to talk about this, but if you fall off that side, we call this lazy Zen. You fell asleep. Now the Chinese word for that is you lost fire. 
means that you don't have qi. Okay, you lost shi qi, which is like you lost circulations, you lost your, your, your life energy, and you fall asleep. The other possibility is that you, you, then, you, you don't fall asleep, but then your mind is uncontrollable. So that's what we call the monkey zen. The Chinese word for that is that you're now engaging or entering Mara. Okay, so your mind is speeding. So going back to this chart, the reason why you can't just become Buddha by sitting, because if you could, then I might as well just take a brick and make a mirror out of that, is because of this pitfall that you either practice lazy zen or you practice monkey zen. I'm going to have to come in here and say, yes, this is totally as well. But then some people take this too far and say, well, I never need to sit. You know, I don't need to even do formal practice. You know, I just, uh, I'll just make this, you know, my, I'm just, um, I just can penetrate this with my mind and being, you know what I mean? So, but what so if it's true? What, what am I, who am I to argue? Well, that's, that's, that's a great point. You know, it, yeah. and some people actually might not need it. But yeah, well, I mean, who am I to argue? General, general mm -hmm. practitioners. That, yeah, right. So, you know, yeah. that's right. It, that's a good point too, Denny. Um, but the, the point is, even if you do sit in formal or formal meditation, these can be, for somebody that's not as advanced, these hindrances can become more noticeable. So then they can be mastered and addressed. Because if we didn't have, the, you know, um, one opportunity of the hindrances, is that they can actually be mastered you know what i mean so if we don't mm -hmm. really experience them right away well that would be great too but yeah. and then again we just ha our practice can be even deeper if we know how to master them and uh yeah i'd yeah. like to hear about the one mind on doubt because doubt is the really dangerous one because it comes masquerading as wisdom a lot of times you know it, it presents itself as wisdom but it, actually it's doubt right Mm -hmm. well, 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 I don't want to spend too much time on that. Sure. We should do okay. that. Okay, we can, yeah, we can yeah. skip that because I want to come yeah. back to that central oh. question about Bodhidharma. Why did he do that? Because I've got. Right. Okay. So, so let me know so, when it would be a good time to share that. Okay. So so I, I, I'm 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 making an argument, right? I'm like the yeah. lawyer, you know, like like just yeah, like yes. you know peeling yes. the onion. Okay. So so Buddha was a yogi. I'm just gonna throw it out there. Because first of all, he's 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 North Indian, right? And you know that's that's what we practice. So so people forget that people forget that he was a yogi, that he renounced at the age of twenty nine, and he was enlightened when he was um, uh, thirty five. So he spent six years as a wandering yogi, and he had two teachers. The first teacher taught him yogi uh, uh, the yogi practice. And he actually reached the seventh stage. Remember we talked about the eighth stage? He reached the seventh stage. Then he says, no, I, I, I need to find a better teacher. So he found a better teacher. You want to mention a little bit of background on this? No, I, I don't know a lot about this, oh, but I, okay. I, I do know the, the end of part of this is that, you know, he he eventually saw that this was not the way what he wanted, because when he came out of these jhana states, these high refined states of consciousness, which some people interpret jhana as being a, a unified gathered. Oh, that's more samadhi, but uh, jhana as absorption. That's how some people. But even then, because it wasn't ultimate liberation, right? And yeah, yeah, because yeah. he was so, he was still inside the three realms. That's right, and he, he was, was still, a, you know, the samsara. Uh, he, he still had to suffer from samsara. He, he was offered that. to teach this too, and he turned it down because he he felt this wasn't the the ultimate the the way out. Even though at the time this was considered this was it, you know. Yeah, he, I mean, he was granted a, a franchise. You know, he yeah. was granted yeah. a franchise. <laughs> You know, so he said, no, no, I want to have my own brand. I don't need a franchise. <laughs> but I also find it really important how uh, he respected those teachers very highly. And uh, the fact of, you know, the eighth, eightfold noble path, the eighth one is uh, um, right samadhi, right? So this played I, I, a really central role. in. in yeah, in, I, in fact, he the very first thing after he was enlightened was, was, was to go back to find his teachers. And unfortunately, they all have passed away. Yeah, so... Now, so so anyway, so so I think I think it's a historical fact that the his, the Buddha was a yogi. He practiced yoga, or at least the, the original yoga, right? Well, and this so is, finally, 
Denny, uh, that's another thing since we're on that real quick. You know, I'm not going to, uh, I would say maybe, maybe not. There's, uh, but the one, I think the Theravada, if I'm getting this right, a lot of times it's, it's interpreted as ascetic. You know, there were practices recorded where he was, you know, kind of starving himself one grain of rice a day where the stomach, uh, he could feel his backbone with the stomach. His hair was falling out. He's holding his breath so he's passing out. Now, there's a, there's a thing called a fakir, which they do things like that, lay on nails of bed, uh, an aesthetic. But then again, you know, the, um, the, the absorption, that's kind of a yogic practice. So yeah. it was something like that, and things have, yeah. might have changed. So it was somewhere yeah. between some kind of a lot of yogic practices and yeah. these aesthetic practices. So, yeah, you can call them either one, I would say. Yeah, you know? so, so, so that's a very good point. I want to I pick up on that. So, so, so I'll talk about how he had reached the, the eighth stage, and that's when he was like, Josh said that he was the aesthetic, where he was just like one grain a day is what all he had. And so I mentioned this before that if you go to the Asian Museum in San Francisco, you go to the um, upper floor, the top floor, that's when they have all the uh, Buddhist uh, artifact. And there was, was one statue, and it was Buddha with essentially his bone and his skin, okay? Now, if you remember that, or if you go to Google it, now, I teach, when we teach meditation, I talk about the seven support point. The seven support point. The seven support point is actually coming from the Taoists, okay? So the seven support point, you know, how you should sit, how you put your hand in your hand, what do you do with the spine, what you do with the shoulder, especially the shoulder where you open up like this, and then, and then also how you position your head so that the thousand meeting energy points and this forms a triangle and everything is, is is straight so that you have this thing called the one pillar supporting the sky you know all that is from the Taoist teaching but who sits like that who sits like that right so so this I want to just kind of bring to so it's too easy for us to say well this is yogi and this is yoga and this is Taoist it's all in fact in fact this is this is our this is important so what did Buddha do? Buddha didn't invent anything. He, you know, in fact, I mean, his literature, that's how he said that he, all he did was he rediscovered a technique that he called the, uh, I'll explain that in a minute, that this technique was something that he rediscovered. So what is that that he discovered? Now, I want to go back to the, the central, uh, central thesis, central theme of the yogi practice. So the, so the yogi practice came from Shiva, Okay, the, the Lord Shiva, which is which is a deity, it's a it's a it's a god, he is the god of, of uh, yoga. Now in the past I, I talk about sate. Sate is uh, is means mindfulness, and I talk about the story of how the word sate is actually the name of a of a princess who was actually a goddess that that became a princess. And then when when he felt that he was she was when she felt that she was insulted by her parents. Um, she jumped into the fire and then went back into the heaven and then reincarnated as the second wife of, of Shiva. And, and so he not only was he the second wife, he was his first student. So the conversation, this is, you know, you take it for what it is, but th there was a conversation that was documented in the Indian literature of the conversation between Lord Shiva and the diva, Prabhati or something like that, I don't remember. And Lord Shiva says that there are these called ch chakras. So that, you know, this is like the energy points, the triangles where the energy lines meet. The energy lines are called the nadi. And there's 72,000 energy lines, and then they meet. And Lord Shiva was the one that says that, that the, it's, a, it's, it's, the, it's a seven, it's the magic seven. So you start with the seven chakras that's as easiest. Then you go and you become, there's 21 of them. And if you can master all 21, you're, that's the best you can do with this human body. And then from the 21, it then has the 109, 108. And 108 is a magic number. And 108 is, is the number that has a lot of mystery, like the, the diameter of the earth and the distance from the earth to the sun. The ratio is 108. The diameter of the moon and the distance between the earth and the moon, the ratio is also 108. And then from 108, it became 112, and then 112, it became 114. 
And so the, the so so these are the different ways that you can achieve some kind of uh, 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 liberation. And Buddha discovered one. And so the argument is that you know Buddha only need one percent of what Lord Shiva had to offer. Now, Denny, was this the? Um... Are these teach? Where do these teachings come from? The chakra, because I I know the Theravada teachings, as far as I understand, they don't mention chakras at all. They do not so, mention chakras, but the Tibetan do. Yes. Yep. The Tibetan um, so do. So when we talk about this... esoteric, that when we talk about esoteric, sure. they do. Yes. They, do. Yeah. they so, actually, in fact, in fact, you remember the history, right? So the Tibetan Buddhism was first brought into from the princess. Remember the princess I talked about, the Tang princess, and so it became very popular. But then it was completely destroyed. And then eventually, the one of the sage went back to India and brought back a different version of that. And so the the chakras uh, is really I, I I'm not I'm not in a position to really talk anything about this. I just wanted to draw the the historical linkage between Buddha and Yogi. It, okay. It's fascinating. I'm glad you did because yeah. I haven't heard this before. I, I, this is this it, is amazing area to to, 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 to explore. The, the really chakra is. thing is yeah. really um, yeah. yeah. It can be controversial as well. Um, I there's a post on uh, my site that if anyone wants to look into that too about other things that aren't heard. But I was just curious. This text is it a Chinese text that was uh, written from? I'll, um, I'll give you some of the links. You know where gotcha. I think yeah we can up. probably okay. do that. Sure. Okay. Okay. Keep so going. let me go on. All right. So, so essentially, what 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 uh, Sakata uh, Gautama did was that he rediscovered this technique that allows the ninth stage of of samadhi. Okay. Now, this is this is the word. So, so this word, this first word means um, the disappearance, the f disappearance of sensation and perception and samadhi. Okay. So, this is the one that says that. You can achieve this ninth stage of samadhi by using only the sensation, but not perception. Perception is when you start using the brain, and that's where the hindrance comes from. So if you learn how to use the perception, okay, so this, this actually perception and, and, and sensation come from the five skandhas. So the five skandhas, the first one is called rupa, form. Then the next one's called sensation, the next one's perception. So people have different words for it, but, but here's what it means. The, the form is everything that is physical. Physical means everything that is both physics and physiology. So the physics are the, the, the light, the sound, the, the touch, and so forth, right? And the physiology is the eye, the nose, the tongue, and the other. So combining that is everything that is physical about our existence. So once we once our physiology engage with the physics, it generate um, it activate the neurons. So now it's about physiology. So sensation is physiology. Is really how we generate the electrical signal, and then all these electrical signals are then collected into our, our brain, our cerebral, and once we activate the brain, that's called perception. Okay, so we and, and it go on. So I'll come back to that. This is very important. And the analogy the Buddha gave for uh, form is a lump of foam, and uh, the the one for feeling was a bu bubbles in the water. And then I want to say per perception, um, uh, yeah, perception is like a, a mirage in the desert. If mm -hmm. I'm getting that right, yes. Very good. Yep. Very good. Mm -hmm. Now, so not only was Buddha a yogi. All of his initial followers were yogi, right? Remember, we talked like they were all doing similar open... practices together. Yeah, yes. remember, you, 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 I don't know, we talked about here or we talked about in the past where you, if you open any sutra, whether it is the Theravada teaching or Mahayana teaching, they always talk about 2,500 students. Where did the 2,500 students come from? It's actually 25 and 5 because he had the five followers, right? Then he, then he got another, I forgot it was 50 or 500 students. Every time, every time he meets someone, that someone is someone who's who who who's a guru, who had a follower, right? And then and then and then they would bring the students. So so he that's how he he, he you know Buddha was in effect. wholesale. He was he was a wholesaler. He wasn't a retailer. Okay, so he just like he go and he 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 convinced the guru, 
And then the guru brought all his followers. So he just like chunks and chunks. So, so all of his students were yogis. What does yogi mean? Yogi means yuja, Y-U-J or yuj. Okay, so that word is, is another English word for that is yok, which is that, that beam that you put in front of two oxen so that when the two oxen pull the car, they can synchronize. That's what yuja means. It's, it means union. Union of what? Union of your body. Since you're living in the desire realm, you only have your body. And the Brahmins. The Brahmins are the ones that's living in your mind, living in the, the form and the, and the formless. So yoga, that's what yoga means, is the union of your body and your mind. Right? So you start with the body. Then the next one is that, so Buddha, he never rejected yoga teaching. That's, that's, a, that's a wrong perception. Because he just naturally assumed that all his students were yogi, he himself were yogi. He never thought about that, this teaching being outside of India. So he never made a point of mentioning the yogi practice in his own practice because it's the prerequisite. Not only was, was, was Buddha a yogi, Bodhidharma was a yogi, right? So Bodhidharma was supposed to be the 28th patriarch of the Indian school, the Chan meditation school, Chanya school. The first patriarch was someone by the name of Maha Kasyapa, who was, who was uh, if you ever seen like the Buddha statue with the two men next to him, the older guy, that's him, right? And so the, I, the story was that, was that um, one day uh, Buddha was getting ready to give a lecture and his, his students were gathering in front of him, and then it, but it took forever. He, he, never, he just sat there. And, and then people noticed that he held on to a flower and all the students were bewildered, except Maha... Uh, Kasyapa was sitting across the way and he was smiling. And then, and then Buddha says, well, you got it. That's, that's, that's Zen, okay? That's I love, Zen. I love this story. Go ahead. Yeah. Or, well, you know, um, it's, it's great because it's not everything needs to be talked about. I, I would say, though, that this story, I was looking into this, and some people claim that that was a, a Chan invention, that it was first It, it, it actually is a Chan invention. Yes, in the gateless gate, but yeah, still, the, the importance yeah. of the teaching. It, it, I, I didn't want to confuse, I don't want to confuse right, the presentation yeah. anymore um, by, by using facts. Point. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It was a Chan, you can, there was, it actually came um, from a, uh, a, a, a book, and that was the only time they ever show up, and then but people kind of even yeah. the fact that yeah. even 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 the argument that he was a twenty patriot, it was also a, a invention. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Now, when you go to Japan and you go to the Zen temples, you see this a lot. This a lot, and, and it translates into this. This is don't establish words. Use mind to transmit mind. Now. There are all kinds of interpretation for that, you know. There's all kinds of interpretation. It's the same thing as you know, sit only, uh, shikatasa. It's all kinds of interpretation for that. But what it really means, this is what I think, that the Zen practice is not about intellect, or it's not about intellectualization. It's about direct experience. That's what it means. But experience. A true experience is experience without hindrances. Yes, because those hindrances can be cloud the actual experience, yes. right? Or, or yes. effect, yes. So why do you practice Yi Jing Jing? Why do you practice Yi Jing Jing? Because you have to have a way of maintaining a healthy and robust body. That is your foundation upon which you can build. You can then build. Uh, your practice. Well, I don't want to say that, but you don't want to mean. But but there's something else that I didn't talk about here. Now, if you practice Yi Jing Jing, you will get a much better appreciation for what the word Jing means. There are two interpretations that are kind of outside the norm. One is that Jing also means connective tissue. So if you interpret it that way, 
then it's a way to enhance your shi, qi, your qi. Okay? Because it's an exercise that works on the connective tissue because when you when you have health problem, it's either because your blood circulation got got, got stuck or that your bioenergy got stuck. Either way, you need to work on that connected tissue. So that's one interpretation of the word Jing. There's another interpretation of the word that I think is even more important here, is that if you go all the way back to the very first book, when they, when they start to formalize the Chinese medicine, the word Jing means spiral core. Why is spiral core so important? The spiral core is where you have perception without sensation. All of our nerve systems, they don't go to the brain. They first go to the spiral core and then it's delivered to the brain. So if you want to have a practice in such a way that, let me go back, it's going to take me some time to go back, but eh, it's not so bad. And why, why you're doing that, uh, Danny? It's yeah, interesting yeah. that the, all the different interpretations too. And yeah, you know, we but my up. interpretation is based on my experience. That's it's, that's it's, exactly what I was getting yeah, at. It's based it's, on my experience that however as I we practice using it Jing, great. Yeah, you as almost have to yeah. experience it. You know, you have and, to experience it. Now you might have a different practice. experience. Yeah. You might have yeah. a different experience, but talk to me when it's an experience. Yes, exactly right. Okay, so. So this is the difference between sensation and perception. Perception is when you use the mind root, which is the brain. Okay, sensation is when your your physiology is interacting with the physics and activating the neurology, and all your nerve is connected back to your spine. And so, yi jing jing is the way to basically is, is a way to prepare your spine, prepare your body, so that you can actually practice towards the ninth stage of samadhi. And sensation is more of a direct experience than perception, because perception, why it's very helpful, is oftentimes we'll, it starts when we're a young child, right? We'll see something and then somebody will tell us, oh, that's this, right? So it's an idea in the mind, it helps us navigate the world so we can know you know what a couch is and what a table is but it's ultimately um a kind of an idea that solidifies to identify to make things easier because if we had to if we saw a couch every time we didn't know it was a couch we had to figure that out every time we saw it it would be it would just take too much time and be too confusing right but the actual sensations of what we're um experiencing that's uh like a direct experience and well, then we can we just layer yeah. um language and yeah. uh ways to yeah. explain what those sensations yeah. are that's over right. the top that's of right. it. it's not so so we the one the one there's a phrase there's a there's a word that we use called equanimity so if you talk about the five hindrances the ultimately the way to escape the five hindrances is with equanimity but I, in Chinese, it's very easy to, to explain that because we know exactly what the opposite is for, for the lack of equanimity. Whereas in English, there's no such word. There's, there's nothing that, that really like pinpoint that says, oh yeah, because you're doing this. So the closest thing to that is, is discrimination, discerning, prejudice, uh, that kind of word. Okay. So, so the idea is, 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 that, is that, so another way of, of of talking about the, the perception versus sensation and talking about the um, back back to the samurais, the two samurais fighting, you know, fighting uh, in, in the in the rain and, and they're just standing there with the sword looking at each other. That's attention without intention. They're fo totally focused, they're totally focused on the sensory. So the minute that, that you move, they know. Sometimes before. Sometimes before, but without intention, because they're not going to assign value to it. So it's not. A, it's never about wants, what they want, what they don't want, and that's the wants and what they don't want comes from the brain, right? So, so I always explain that to my, so my, so my, so my, uh, 
my dad who suffers from dementia, uh, I need I need to I need to help him both physically and mentally. So one of the things that I do is I introduce him to Guan Yin Pusa, the, the goddess of mercy. And one of the things that I told him, I asked him, I said, look, he has a nice, very nice statue in his room, in his house. And I said, look at the statue. I said, notice the eyes. Mm -hmm. And so he looked at me and he says, what's wrong with the eyes? He said, why? You notice that the eyes is always looking down. They don't, the, the, the Guan Yin Pusa doesn't look at you because they don't care who you are. They don't make, they don't say, oh yeah, because you deserve it or you don't deserve it. It's mercy, it's, it's loving kindness. Bodhisattva you know. of compassion, right? Yes. Right, compassion. It, it compassion, doesn't discriminate so. between the, the, the compassion that's, yeah. that's given. Yeah. yeah. It's like this yeah. metaphor of the sun, you know, the sun doesn't think, okay, well, this person deserves my warmth or, and this person doesn't, it just yeah. shines. Yeah, so a lot of a lot of Master Jiru students uh, practice um, uh, uh, Tai Chi, right? What was what what was the name of that that practice? I forgot now. Well, so, uh, no, it, it is Tai Chi, right? It is a form of Tai Chi, but they have a different okay. name. Okay. Uh, they have a different name. I forgot what it is, but but I I have many conversations with them. So so Master Ma, uh, Grandmaster Sam, who who taught them the Tai Chi, who oh, was actually yeah, uh, yeah. Ili 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 Chang, Ili, Ili Jing, yeah, Ili Jing. So, so, so actually, Grandmaster Sam and Master Jiru, they were Dharma brothers, right? And so, Master Jiru actually know everything except that he doesn't show it. Um, so, the one thing that that Master Grandmaster Sam teach is no thinking. Don't don't slow down your reaction by trying to be in, in, intellectualize it. No thinking. Bypass your brain. Yes, even so perception. So they can react faster. Yeah, yeah, you don't even think, well, that's an arm or, you know, not, none of that. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. Now, but, I, I, I still manage to break lots of china in my kitchen, but I do notice that sometimes when something drops, I would catch it, whereas before I couldn't do it. I, I would yes, never thought that I would have that. Yeah, it's a gut reaction now. It's just, you just, you, you, just, you yeah, learn you don't, to. You yeah. Just, yeah. So yeah. I, mean, I want to go back to that main question. We I thought we were going to uh, felt we were going to talk more about Bodhidharma. That's okay because Bodhidharma is this fascinating figure. You know, there's so many stories surrounding him. I'm going to include some of those in the show notes. We don't really have time to get into those today. But you know, that central question that Denny put up. You know, why did he meditate in the cave for nine years? I just want to go into some of these that I had. These are kind of side notes, kind of more of a flowering uh, or flavoring, I should say, and and hopefully not a you know to show off study and knowledge and um, you know get lost in the weeds here. Just so, some so, interesting. So, thoughts. Josh, yeah. if I may, I, I, uh -huh. I'll let you I'll let you finish the show by continuing with your thought here. But okay. I just want to kind of summarize something here and then sure. and let you go. So okay. I just want to because I asked the question. I said, why why did he you know why didn't oh, yeah. he give us any teaching other than Yi Jing Jing? Because Yi Jing Jing is a yogi practice. And both the historical um, uh, Buddha and the Buddhadharma were yogis. And the yogi practice is to allow the union of your body and your mind. And you can't do that unless you have a robust body. Because even though, like I said, that, you know, like even with Qi, you know, you, you energy line, you're building a bridge between the body and the mind, you know. So if you stop your body, but you don't have the mind, then you're building a bridge to nowhere. But if you did even have a body, then there's nothing to build. Right. Okay. Go ahead, Josh. Sorry about that. that. You know that. No, that's totally right. And there's yeah. actually one famous story that I just came across looking this up, where he is. If you don't have a body, well, there's a story where I, if I'm getting this right, his arms and legs kind of disappear. It's kind of more of a mythological thing, right? But mm -hmm. I mean, it makes sense, Denny's um, conclusion here, because think about it, if you're literally meditating in a cave for nine years. And you're, most of that's kind of sitting. Well, you're going to need something to maintain the body because the body's just not going to maintain perfect perfect health, right? So you're going to be so the, this Yi Jin Jing uh, physical practice. It's kind of like a one of the most efficient ways with the smallest amount of time to kind of have energy and strength in the body, yeah, right? That's and a very good point. That, it doesn't distract from the yeah, you know. It kind that's of unifies, a very very good it point. Together, right? Yeah, that's a very good point. So let me show the last slide. Okay. So the Yi Jing Jing that we practice, there's, there's, I, as far as I can tell, there's three different versions, and the one that, the version that we practice, I, I'll just give a little bit of history to that, was taught to us by uh, Master Jiru. Master Jiru uh, came to the United States and he became the abbot for two temples, and then um, the 
abbot emeritus, if you will, of those two temples is a monk by the name of Meng Qi, who came to, uh, who actually escaped communists in 1949, went to Hong Kong, and then eventually made his way to North America. Before he came to Hong Kong, when he was still in China, he was the 48th abbot of a temple called Tinning Temple. Now, if you trace the history of that temple, then you will find that the, the monk who started it is a sort of quote-unquote crazy monk called Fa Yuan. He himself was a disciple. He wasn't exactly an official disciple. This is, this is when the fourth patriot had already gave the gasa and the, and, the, and the bowl to the fifth patriot. And so he actually had retired and he wandered through the countryside. And then he saw this crazy monk and he took him in and taught him. And then, and then after that, then Fa Yuan decided that he needs to be out there active again. He started building lots of temple. And of course, the, the fourth patriot learned it from the first patriot. So the story was that when Master Yu would learn it from uh, Master Ming Qi, Ming Qi explained to Master Yu that this is a technique that all the abbot use while they're in seclusion. The word, the Chinese word for abbot is, is uh, square meter. This is the room that they seclude themselves in. And, and the Chinese meter is more like 10 feet. So the room is no bigger than, more like eight feet by eight feet. It's a tiny little room. And so Master Ming Chi says that when all the abbots go into seclusion, this is what they practice. So this is back to what Josh said is that you need something to energize your body when you're secluded. Now, what you notice is that if you ever see a documentary of these chambers where the abbot seclude, there, it's, the, the floor is always stone. But in the middle of the floor, there's a dip. There's always like a dip. Okay, so I never understood why there would be a dip until you practice Yi Jing Jing, this version of Yi Jing Jing. Then you All right, notice that it, yeah. every time they jump. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows how much they've done that. So yeah. So, yeah. How, and how many generations, right? Anyway, yeah. anyway. I'm, Go ahead, Josh. Well, Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, Sorry okay. for interrupting hey, again. Hey, you know that's what I've done so much to other people. So it's 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 okay. No, okay. Please I mean. please continue. Please continue. So yeah, yeah my battery's running, and then I've got to go on to the the next thing. But yeah, I just you know it's just it's so fascinating all these stories, and you know um, I love, love Denny's teachings on the the imagery as well, and such a nice linear easy way to follow and learn. While my is more spiral, so yeah, I'll continue. So the thing is, with Bodhidharma, you know, how did he actually, uh, this is kind of unanswerable, but you know, how did he come up with those teachings in the cave? It's a, a fascinating, I guess he had plenty of time to come up with that, you know, and, you know. I'm not uh, sure, I, I'm not sure yeah, he came up yeah, with it's it. it's kind of rhetorical. I, 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 I yeah. think it's more like I, I think it's more like he 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 edited it. You know, he 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 he. It, but you know, how like, did he come? But how did he, where did it come from? The origin is what because he was at. a yogi. Well, see that you, this is yeah. It it's is a circular just, argument. I understand, exactly, but yeah. but uh, let me ask well, you the question. Well, I mean, let well, me ask you a question. I I think that um, when Bodhidharma came to China, he noticed that nobody is practicing the body. Everybody was you know doing either mental. That's diarrhea right. or mental uh -huh. constipation. Okay, so he got accept. He got upset. Well, what do you think, Master Jiru faced when he came to North America? And he noticed that everyone who quote unquote was practicing Buddhism was was again doing the same thing. So what did he do? He went into the cave. Well, it wasn't a cave. It was a trailer. He went into the trailer for three years. And what did he yeah. do when he came out? He came out with this bright five breathing yeah. exercise. Yeah. So how did he learn that? He didn't learn it. It, he took. To air, he yeah. took. No, it, it didn't even came to him. He took mm -hmm. everything that he has Condensing. learned. Condensing. Yes. Yeah. He took everything that he was learned. Right. He he grew up right. uh, with his grandfather, mm -hmm. uh, who who was a Shaolin uh, martial artist. He did, he himself had learned Tai Chi two separate time, two separate lineage, and then and then he, he took everything. He just said, "Look, I got to put it in the package," mm -hmm. you know. So that yeah. I could, I could. Uh, it, it's like asking uh, Isaac Newton to teach calculus. Right. Yes. You know, yeah. he has to come so, up with. He says, "Well, I can't 
that, that's too much. So I got to come up with something, right? And so this ties into the thing with uh, Bodhidharma too. You know, I he he probably saw that stuff, right? Like you're saying, and said, yeah. this is probably what needs to be taught now. So this is yes. what needs to be taught now to what's going on here. You know. Yes. So yes. some of the other things, you know, um, I was interested about here the uh, well you know the and don't answer that we can come back to maybe at the end but just put the question out here you know this was kept secret and only done by abbots in private right and then how is it passed down and then why did they keep it secret and how and why did this version of Yi Jin Jing finally open up to the wider public and the significance of that so well it wasn't kept secret it wasn't kept secret that was the inaccurate yeah. come back then let me I need to run down the, the rest of these here so going back to Bodhidharma and I uh, it's, I have to go a little bit faster here since we're running out of time. So, you know, you talked about the polishing rock, um, but, you know, a lot of times that's um, attributed to Bodhidharma. But so I was thinking maybe he would, so one story is he, he did that whole story and then he went and meditated in a cave. So maybe that was to, you know, this is speculation, obviously all this is speculation, but just to prove that even though he criticized it, he was still going to go do it anyway, just to prove, you know, just to maybe carry out that um you know that even though he criticized something he was going to go do it the very thing he criticized and said it wasn't necessary um so and well, then no, also, no. What he went he into the cave on, doesn't look. mean that he was sitting all the time well that's true too right yeah but still i mean you almost might as well be if you're secluded yeah. that way so that's a good point so what you know what if he could see into the future too you know and he knew the outcome of what was going to be of you know the uh that you know sitting or well meditating for nine years wasn't going to make that much a difference but he went and did it anyway uh it's kind of a weird point but now that uh, there was a show i'll include in the notes there's a tr tibetan translation of this where instead of facing a cave wall for nine years they say it's actually facing a reality for nine years so that's an interesting point too now some there's uh, newer stuff that prajna tara uh, his teacher, some people are giving some kind of um, evidence and historical records and whatnot that was actually a female. So if that was the case, we don't have time to go into that. It, how much of the symbology of a cave is actually kind of symbolic of the feminine womb? You know, well, and then you have male and female. Uh, let me, I, I need to. No, 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 no. Yeah. When you enter form realm and uh, formless realm, there's no more gender. Right, right, exactly. But we're talking about a conventional, regular desire realm level here. You know what I mean? So yeah. and that would be a teaching to the mass uh, populace, I would think, as well. So the works, there are works attributed to Bodhidharma, but you said that he doesn't come out with you know anything but Yi Jin Jing, basically. The the mind to mind transmission method, you know, at um, that kind of, I think maybe it was reinforced, it could be possibly reinforcing that too, because you don't need kind of a written down or spoken teaching if there's this mind-to-mind -mind experiential thing. There, like the flower sermon, nothing really needs to be said, right? So it could possibly reinforce that uh, kind of teaching method. Um, the other, um, let's see, you know, this is a really, um, kind of strange thought and please, I, I, I want people to jump in here and correct me and, and I'm kind of showing my ignorance here perhaps, but you know, the Buddha was in a warrior caste, right? So I was wondering how much, um, if, if, and some people talk about an ancestral karma. So I was wondering how uh, Bodhidharma, you know, he was, uh, influenced a lot of the Kung Fu and stuff. So I'm wondering you know, the, the Buddha's ancestors, if they were, you know, his, he seemed to come from the royal caste, but the royal caste and the warrior caste are kind of lumped in together, if I'm not mistaken. So I'm wondering if his whole lineage had warriors in it, and if there was some kind of ancestral karma link, karmic link be behind Buddha's um, uh, lineage and his family that he was came into, and uh, if there was warrior things, and now the Shaolin warriors uh, with that, and how that might interrelate. But remember that uh, contemplating karma is one of the imponderables that can lead to um, uh, craziness, right? So, um, so it, and then, uh, there's so many different parallels here, potential parallels, like you said, with, with Shifu, Master Jiru. Uh, but I'm I'm really not. Uh, although I could say things, I'm gonna. I think it's too early for me to comment on on that. So, so that's just a bunch of stuff there. And yeah, yeah. Well, the, yeah. The, the, there there are documents. People do talk about how the historical Buddha was both a scholar and a warrior. 
he was trained very well in both both sides of the arts before he, uh, he before he left the palace. Yeah, that he that. Uh, yeah. That's right. Yep. Yeah, I, I think even there was a story about how. Uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it it uh, it's good. Right now, anyway, good. right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I'd like to say the um. Well, I probably forgot some of the comments you, uh, you had on that, but. Well, we can we can possibly put other things in the show notes, but we've run probably over in an hour and a half here, right? So yeah, hour and thirty four minutes. Okay, yep. okay. Well, we 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 got it out there, huh? Yes, exactly. And there'll be even more for your study in, in and, the show and, notes. And, and we well, still don't have an empty mind. I don't get it. Right. Well, no wonder. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Josh. I'm gonna I'm gonna end the stream. Thanks, okay. everyone, and see yeah, you thanks, in a Jenny. month. Right, always the last Tuesday of the month at 10 o'clock Pacific time. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.